Welcome, welcome very, very much to Conversation. It's a pleasure to welcome the program. A dear friend of mine, a friend of the universe, and a major intellectual force in the world, I would say, coming on very strong now, having uh, had a very interesting life story to tell. And he's the author, among other many major works, uh, all of his work is of major concern and should be paid attention to by the world intellectual and broader community. But his name is Howard Bloom. And welcome, Howard. And he's the pre he's the author of a recently to uh, penned uh, work that is called, uh, as you can see, the God Problem: How a, How a Godless Cosmos Creates a Major Tour de Force Intellectual Effort. And uh, we're going to be talking about that and other matters. So once again, Howard, welcome to conversation. Thanks, Harold. Yeah, this has been preceded this week's programming with some things about physics and larger issues and that kind of thing. I know that's, you're an omnivore or an om, mm -hmm. om well, you have a omnologist, term, omnologist right. which is a term that gets toward thinking comprehensively in a systems way. And you do, and you write uh, very, very uh, beautifully, if I may say so, with a great, one of the great saving graces of anything is that you have a very well honed and very well used sense of humor. <laughs> the right word can make a big difference, yeah. right? When you're talking about some of the intellectual, you know, the people of the 19th English century, you would have the words that would be just perfect, you know. So congratulations Thanks. on that. And the book is recommended to one and all. In fact, the presence and the purpose of, uh, of, uh, of Howard Bloom and Universe should be paid attention to by one and all. And so it's a pleasure and honor to have you here. Thanks. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Yes, yeah, good. We've got a lot going on and everything. And we were talking, uh, we've been talking in that there's, uh, we can just uh, jump in anywhere. We're going to show a little clip. Uh, I appreciate you're going along and Roberto, who's helping us, going along by putting a little clip that was done by the uh, History Channel. As a, uh, uh, as a tribute to the ability to have important intellectual understanding contained within a multimedia context. Right. They put together a little piece, History of the World. We're going to throw, show a little clip of that to show what might be able to be done, and I understand that's something relevant to you also. You're also even thinking about putting on some video or, or multimedia presentations of intellectually relevant material in a planetarium context, which I think puts you ahead of the curve on another track. You keep running way out ahead of the curve on all the people, the processes going on on the planet, but it's not always been so pleasant for you. As I understand, we've had a little conversation. There was a period in your life where you suffered what is called chronic fatigue syndrome right. for, a, for a long extended period. For 15 period. years. For 15 years. Yeah, for 15 years I was uh, imprisoned in a bedroom. How horrible. Yeah, well, the, the, let's, yeah, let's, let's take let's a talk little about context. It should be brought up and put on the table because it's pretty widespread. And, I mean, 15 years is right. really getting absurd right. in terms of the length of that. But it's also a condition that is affecting more and more people, at least maybe there. Well, you share because you know well, about it. Well, first, a little bit of context. When yeah, I was please. 16 years old, uh, a poem, there were two poems that had a tremendous influence on me. One was The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, yeah. which basically, by T.S. Eliot, yeah. which basically says if you have anything important to do, anything heroic, anything that you think will define you, start at this minute, because if you don't, if you mm. procrastinate, by mm. the time you get around to finding time for it, it will mm. be too late, your life force will have been spent. You won't have enough, enough strength to do it. Wow. That's number one, number, uh, and that became a motto, a guiding beacon for my get life. Busy. Yeah. Get busy, and do it, yeah. And specifically, yeah. the things that you think are the most important. Right. Secondly, yeah. there was a poem by Edna St. Vincent Millay. She had written it when she was 16 years old, uh -huh. and it was called Renaissance. And it, in essence, said, if you want to be able to see the infinite and the tiniest of things, yeah. then come to understand the most extreme feelings of everybody on the planet, especially uh -huh. the most extreme sufferings. And through wow. that, you will come to the point where even the tiniest of things becomes an infinity for you. Wow. So okay. those here are, are two guiding things for you. Right? Yeah, and so yeah. those have shaped my life. Okay. And so at, uh, in 1988, well, I've done some very extreme things. You have done some extreme yeah. things, in, 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 not the least of which is the atomic, uh, writing of this book well, and other things too. My yeah. life is science. Yeah. Uh, I got into theoretical physics and microbiology when I was 10. Uh -huh. and, um, 
but I wanted to know about the extremes of, I wanted to know about the extreme emotions, the mass emotions, the mass passions that shape human history. And but, you wanted also to understand the whole evolutionary process from the Big Bang yes, forth. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so I wasn't going to get access to mass passions, the kind of things that Adolf Hitler evoked when he put on a torchlight parade. Yeah. I was not going to get access to that in grad school. I had fellowships to four different grad schools. I yeah. turned them down. Uh -huh. and you did? I, yeah. Why? Well, I went because I wasn't going to be allowed to work on my subject area. Oh, my okay. subject area was using the tools of microbiology and theoretical physics to understand Which you had access to as an autodidact. Do you count yes. yourself an autodidact? Yeah, because I was Following reading. your own blitz, Yeah, right? I read yeah. two books a day uh -huh. under the desk from the time I was 10 years old uh -huh. at school and never paid any attention in school whatsoever. Rather than paying attention to teach like you should have yeah. without chewing gum. Right. Well, yeah, you're right. an anti authoritarian, uh, and very, apparently very. I'm an anti authoritarian too yeah, because yeah. I paid no attention to the authorities. Yeah. Well, but you're inner directed. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, right. So okay, yeah. um, I felt I was going to be ripped away from my real. Uh, a scientific challenge in life, yeah. understanding those emotions that got people to feel uh, this ecstatic sense of being. With all due respect, not only the emotions, but the context out of which even humanity emerged, yeah. and the, the large comprehensive right. context, because uh, you have great interest in the physics, and you your book goes right into the beginning of all the things by which. And the the book is one of the strangest histories of mathematics yeah. that you'll ever read in your life. But yeah. it's all true. This yeah. is all the reality of right. math. So. Yeah. It's math, science, all of our tools that yeah. I try to bring to bear. And I wasn't going to be allowed to do it in grad school. Yeah. I'd be giving paper and pencil tests to 20 students in exchange for credits toward their college yeah. requirement. It's, it's and like, the, what like, mass emotion was I going to be able to inspire right. there? Yeah, and you were also interested in a comprehensive context. Right. You were interested in seeing patterns between the a lot of picture, specialists. The big picture, as you put it. The One of the reasons picture. you're running Machio Kaku this week yeah, is yeah. to give people a big picture. Right, right. And the big picture has always been profoundly important to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. So I not important in terms of, in fact, I've mentioned to you and the thing, uh, Fuller, who I admired, you, right. familiar, everyone's familiar with him in terms of that, is that there should be a department at the University of Everything. Yes. Instead, what they've done is they've divided and conquered the intellectual community right. by getting them specialized out on one thing so they can't become a threat. Well, to the power relationship of the people who run the world. Remember, any That's good thing... a little that, overdrawn, maybe, but it's, there's truth in that. Well, any good thing in overdose is a poison. You need a certain amount of specialization yeah. to work out the puzzle pieces yeah, but so, that, be, uh, so a generalist can then put the puzzle pieces together. But there aren't any places at the university where there is opening on that. For Everything generalists, is, right. Uh, no, We're no, out there, of there are, it's there, all there should be something where... There should be something, there should be a department of everything. Right. Or there should be an overarching system of production of, ge of multimedia content. And we want to show a clip for that. Well, in a minute. that's, you know, um, yeah. that. Even onto planetariums coming. Well, down, I tried to put I tried to put something together for college sophomores who are up against a real puzzle. Who am yeah, I? Yeah. And who am I <laughs> That's really? That's a biggie. <laughs> yeah, and who am I really comes up because they're interested in biology, they're interested yeah. in psychology, they're interested in art history, yeah. and people, adults, are telling them. Make up your mind. Yeah, Why are right. you an art well, historian, yeah, yeah, a biologist, right, right. a psychologist, exactly. until you make up your mind you're a and nobody? And that's for practical reasons about how you're going to be able to make money. Well, oh, I, no, I wanted to, economically in a practical way. I wanted to create world. a category, a yeah. world, a uh, word for kids who insisted on holding on to all three interests simultaneously. Uh -huh. And that word was omnology. Omnology um, yes. is good. Is it in the dictionary? No, it's is not in the, in the dictionary. It'll but get you can there. find it on Google. No, but it's going to get there. Yeah, that would be nice. It'll get into the Oxford English Dictionary. But there's a man. Manifesto for Omnology. It's uh -huh. very short. It takes less than 30 seconds to read. Is it on your There's, site? Uh, well, you'll find it all over the place online. Okay. But if you go to bigbangtango.org, uh, you can find it. What's or Big Bang Tango? Is that Big a major Big Bang so Tango. Big yeah. Bang Tango is a phrase that I came up with around 2000 mm -hmm. um, because I was putting together the big picture of the whole universe right. from the very, very beginning. Part of this and, book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I was watching a kind of a pulse in the cosmos, yeah. a pulse between two primary forces, hmm. attraction and repulsion. Right, those I was, are two biggies. Yeah, yeah, I was watching attraction and repulsion show up at the very beginning in mm. quarks. Yeah. When you're born as mm. a quark, mm. um, you're born with a little internal etiquette book, mm. and it tells you who to get together with, that's mm. attraction, mm. and who to flee from, mm. that's repulsion. Mm. You already know mm. these, these basic facts yeah. of uh, 
how to get along as a polite it's quark. It's built into their DNA recipe. Right, and it's quarks, yeah. and uh, even though they don't have DNA. Yeah. So you've got that mm. primitive form of attraction or repulsion, mm -hmm. and if you follow it along, you'll mm -hmm. see it re recurring at every level of the cosmos. Mm -hmm. It's a massive force of attraction, mm -hmm. actually a very quiet, whispering force of attraction mm -hmm. that pulls together galaxies and stars, and that mm -hmm. crushes stars so badly. And relates to human processes as right, well. Right, exactly. And sociological Oh, yes, issues. you yeah. see attraction or repulsion in yeah. humans. You, you look at a young girl at the age of 13, she's just developed all the sexual cues that are yeah. designed to utterly mm. fascinate mm. you, mm. and you're utterly fascinated and you associate her with beauty. Yeah. See that same girl at the Romeo age of 75, and, yeah, yeah. and it, those very same body parts mm. that were sexual attractants, that mm. were attractors yeah. uh, when she was 13, are all, all of a sudden repulsors, because yeah. you can put out attraction cues and mm. you can put out repulsion cues. Well, the same operates throughout the universe in a certain sense and everything. Right. You know? Yeah, the principles are there and it's a complex answers think we have patterns and that's something that's really interesting and and we're we're going to get to that and I'm wondering if we could you were you were willing to indulge me in a certain sense because I'm very interested in multimedia you're getting interested in multimedia as a means of well expression. I've been into it for a long long time that's right and you also got very heavily involved in popular music yeah I you, you know, again you, to get out of grad school yeah. I went into something I knew absolutely nothing about popular culture mm -hmm. and I had been kidnapped to found a uh, or to run the literary magazine at NYU my yeah. school uh -huh. and I turned it into an experimental graphics and literary magazine then uh -huh. I took off with the artists that I'd assembled and we started a commercial art studio wow. and there I was bang in a field I didn't know anything about business uh, manager uh, business well, yeah manager, I was uh, the business person and I knew nothing involved, about that you got involved with the whole of the music uh, popular music Music and world. later I founded the biggest PR firm in the music industry. Biggest PR firm by measurement of a, a, a um, By the staff, size of the staff. It was the biggest music staff, and uh, that is the biggest PR staff in music. And you were representing in and a I certain sense. And I was representing Michael Jackson, Prince, Bob Marley. Michael, Michael Jackson, Prince, Michael Jackson, Prince, Jackson, Prince Bob, Marley, Bob Marley, Bette Midler, ACDC, well. Kiss, Queen, uh, Billy Joel, Billy Idol, Paul Simon, Peter Gabriel, David uh -huh. Byrne. To name um, just a few yeah, of the smaller, just a few, smaller right, number. Right, exactly. Names. Where were you at the time of Woodstock? Um, at, I was down here in New York City, probably in Park Slope, Brooklyn, yeah. where I've been living since 1965. Mm -hmm. uh, a friend, uh, some friends of mine went up there and, and told me about it while, not while it was happening. We didn't have cell phones back then. We no, didn't no. have instantaneous communication. Yeah. Yeah. But within 24 hours, I had heard about it. But you didn't get up there? No, okay. no. I, uh, it was 1967, I think it Nine, was. 1969. Yeah, and August 15, 19. Uh, I was there. Yeah. Well, I was there in, in, in Great Toe. We had a big weather balloon from, I was New Paltz, right? Right. There, the professor there. What were you doing in we, a weather balloon? Well, no, we, but we had, a, we, I was a professor there. Yeah. And we had all these people and everything. And we had a great big eight foot weather balloon because we were from New Paltz, sister yeah. community. Woodstock right. and we filled it with helium and we took it and tethered it to the ground so the people from Woodstock right, could f find would the know where to gather. Yeah. 600,000 people yeah. and they were just row, row, row. Yeah. They're sitting in this oxbow thing like that right. and then finally my friend who became a very good friend and he just passed, I was really yeah. sorry, Richie Havens kicked yeah. it off by singing Freedom Amazing. and it just reverberated out and the whole thing was an epiphany. Amazing. There was something amazing going on around 1970 right. on this planet, in my humble opinion. Right. I think there's a good chance that number that in the large in the in the length of uh, the, that the year one is going to uh, is going to emerge as about 1970, not 2,000 years ago. Well, or 10, certainly 000. people like Marilyn Ferguson who Marilyn wrote the Ferguson, yeah uh, the Aquarian Conspiracy, I yeah. think was the name of her book. Yeah, yeah. Thought that the year one was going to be approximately 1967. Did she say? That? I want to get. She didn't say it precisely. No, no, but that but was basically did. her impression. Yes. I think that's likely to happen because there were things going on existentially significant in terms of the extension of consciousness and that kind of thing that could be argumentation for that period. But in, 19, in 1961 and 1962, yeah. I had dropped out of school uh -huh. um, brief, briefly for three years. And the onset of, of the fatigue school. thing was when? That was 1988. Okay. And yeah. in 61 or 62, I dropped out of school because uh -huh. I, I was... Up I in felt Buffalo. It was, no, this is oh. at Reed College in Portland, Oregon. Oh, Reed's a good school. Yeah, I and yeah. I felt it was really urgent to find Zen Buddhist Satori, Zen okay. Buddhist Enlightenment. That's so something. 
So like Diogenes? I, I went off um, hitchhiking and riding the rails, oh, good, riding wonderful. on freight trains. Oh, good. And people started dropping out of their jobs and mm. following me. And we ended, up in a, yeah. Yeah, we ended up in a big pink condemned house in yeah. Berkeley. Yeah. And I left the country for a year and went off to live in a kibbutz in Israel. When right. I got back, mm -hmm. time magazine had given a name to the this movement that I'd accidentally helped found. Mm. They called it the hippie movement. The hippie so movement. I was that basically came right out of the beat movement. The yeah, beat, the we, I was looking after I went down to San Francisco. Yeah, I yeah. hitched down to San Francisco yeah. from Port from Seattle actually. Yeah. Um, and took most of the trip with five murderers from mm. Vancouver. Wow. They were heroin addicts. They'd mm. run out of heroin. They yeah. were hoping that San Francisco would have heroin. Yeah. And the only reason they picked me up was because I was barefoot <laughs> and had long curly hair at a time when everybody else had crew cuts. Uh, right. And they figured I looked just peculiar enough mm. that I might know where the heroin was. Well, All I, of the usual suspects. Yes, yeah, I, right, I right. didn't, but yeah. it was an amazing trip. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I was looking for the beatniks mm -hmm. because I'd been reading about them through my teenage years yeah, right. and I couldn't find any Anybody that I could associate and, with, yeah, right, yeah, in Buffalo, yeah. New York. Yeah. And I felt this is my group. This is where I belong. At last, I'll have people I can associate you with. You have to get, you did your puberty. You have to get the anti May movie. Yes, where exactly. Was, uh, how bleak was yes. my puberty yes. in Buffalo? And how that's bleak a, was mine? It, yeah, that's um, a line you'd want right. to have somewhere. You could put it up on the wall. Right. But listen, we could go on. You're too damn right. interesting. That's one of the problems. And we also said you were ready to indulge me and Robert in the booth. Uh, is that they've got the History Channel, and right. we're interested in multimedia communication in a comprehensive vein. Right. And I think they put together what to me was a very good piece of work in terms of the graphics and the writing and so forth, where they, they, they got it, they called it the history of the world in two hours. Right. And that took, uh, you know, some they had ads and that sort of thing. Right. But they have graphics, and what they're attempting to do is to begin to get the history of the universe down into a pattern. And it seemed to me that they were going to share about to eight minute clip or something, right. nine minutes. And it, they're going through from the beginning of the Big Bang. Right. And everything. And they're going through the formation of the elements and all that kind of stuff. Right. In a comprehensive thing, that, uh, a presentation that with graphics that I think it's worthwhile playing in order to sort of set the theme for this right. hour and a half thing okay. that we've got ahead of us. So maybe in the, uh, in the studio, if you could set up that, uh, Robert. Uh, that uh, begin that program, uh, that DVD from the History Channel, the history of the world in two hours. To the present you can pump day, it in here, please. How the planet prepared for the rise of man. How the Stone Age led to the steam engine. How the first seeds sprouted into cities and civilizations. Everything is connected, and the path leads to you. It took history 13.7 billion years to unfold. We'll show you everything you need to know in the next two hours. This is our infant universe. Everything that will ever exist, everything that will ever happen, all begins here, within this tiny bundle of energy, smaller than an atom. And right now, history as we know it is about to mysteriously begin. For reasons we may never know, our universe suddenly erupts. In a millionth of 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 a second, it went from a size smaller than an atom to bigger than a galaxy. Whoosh! What you're seeing is energy, and it's one key to understanding everything that will unfold in the next two hours. Within a fraction of a second, the Big Bang creates all the energy that will ever exist. All the energy that will power the stars, that will fuel anything that ever lives. All the energy that you will ever consume dates back to the beginning of time. 
When you put gas into your car, you're tapping energy that was created during the Big Bang. You're tapping the energy of the universe itself. We're only a few minutes into our two-hour journey, but already 380,000 years have passed. You are about to witness the birth of your original ancestors, the first atoms. This is hydrogen. The universe will use it to make everything in the world around us. Hydrogen is like a baseball team. You say, what player do I want to start my team with? Well, if I want to start a universe, I want to start it with hydrogen. Because from that, with a lot of heat and a lot of pressure, you can build more kinds of atoms. The first atoms blast through the early universe. And luckily for us, they don't spread out evenly. Because in those tiny pockets with more atoms, gravity, the great sculptor of the early universe, begins to work its magic. The first galaxies are beginning to form, revealing a timeless secret of the universe. Throughout history, whenever more matter and energy can be drawn together in one place, more complex things can emerge. We have all of these urban centers around the planet where so much creativity, so much art, so much science, so much culture came about because of all these opportunities for things to interact with each other. Really, in a sense, where there is stuff, new stuff can develop, and where there isn't anything, nothing much can develop. Three hundred million years after the Big Bang, inside of forming galaxies, gravity continues to squeeze together clouds of gas and dust, causing pressure and heat to violently rise. When the temperature reaches 18 million degrees Fahrenheit, hydrogen atoms slam together, creating a new element, helium, and radiating bursts of energy. The first stars are born. Suddenly, there were these new beacons of light shining forth, pouring energy into the universe. Let there be light. But something is missing from this early universe. There are billions of stars, yet not a single planet. To form planets, and eventually people, to take the next leap that would make all of history possible, the universe needs more to work with than just hydrogen and helium. The complicated elements, the, the heavier things that we build stuff out of, for example, iron or life built out of carbon and things like that, they're actually manufactured in stars. We may see stars like our own sun as sources of light, but there is something bigger happening deep inside. Stars are element factories. They fuse hydrogen into helium, helium into lithium, forging 25 of the most common elements we'll need to live, including carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and iron. So, more than 12 billion years ago, stars are already creating the element that will spur the Iron Age, allow for the building of cities, and the creation of some of mankind's most famous monuments. But a look at the Statue of Liberty reveals the next challenge awaiting the early universe. While the statue's frame is iron, her skin requires an element too heavy to be made in stars. For Lady Liberty to have material for her skin. For there to be gold for wedding rings. 
or uranium for nuclear reactors. Some elements had to be created another way. Stars don't have enough energy to do the job. But if the element factory isn't powerful enough, how about blowing up the factory? Just a few million years after the first stars formed, some of them exploded. Wham! These explosions, known as supernovas, are the biggest blasts in the universe since the Big Bang, providing the extra boost of energy needed to fuse heavier elements. In the fiery blast of their own destruction, stars create uranium, gold, all the rest of the elements that will fill our world, including copper. The periodic table of the elements is really sort of a library of matter in the universe. Those are your building blocks. Everything is coming out of that particular chemistry set. Supernovas are absolutely necessary for us to be here. You know, we have iron in our blood. We have little bits of old supernova, therefore, just floating around through us. We are all stardust. Okay, well, that's a that's <laughs> a thing. You know, it's pretty well put together, right. I think. Yes, it's very and good. It, it is good, and the thing one wants to know is, um, among other things, is that they're going to put um, th thirteen point seven two billion years into two hours. That's a pretty good job yes. to try and do it. And a lot of those sub. Did you see some of the, the images over there? Einstein coming just for, it was very, very well done in terms of multimedia. Right. We're trying to be involved in multimedia. I think right. we're moving that way right. as well in trying to get these patterns between very large systems thinking. It's it, uh, information overload from its pattern recognition. Norbert and here, Wiener there's said. the key now. Okay, yeah. Um, remember, I was kidnapped to um, run the literary magazine at NYU. What yeah. did I do with it? I hated literary magazines. I thought they were excruciatingly boring. Okay. They're all with little blue covers and yeah. the typeface is really bad. And mm. if they sit in a room, you want to flee the room. Yeah. Right. So um, I decided to turn it into a picture book, into a graphics magazine. Crumb, and cartoons. And, and, and yeah. it was the yeah. days of Crumb, yeah. though yeah. none of uh, he showed up in my art studio a did year he really later. Hear yes. Right. Yeah, it but yeah. uh, but nonetheless, so there was the combination of literature, mm -hmm. that is specifically poetry and yeah. graphics. Right, right. And you're right, science, graphics, poetry, uh, they all fit. Uh, Why? Where do they all fit? Uh, They're all part of the pattern making machinery. Right, right, there right. are patterns that we can somehow comprehend without right. being able to explain them. And what do we do? We, we express those in pictures and we express those in poetry. Yeah. They're the first step at approaching mysteries. Okay. That once yeah. we pull yeah. them into the light with right. the tools mm -hmm. of poetry yeah. and, and the arts, uh -huh. we can then begin to work on with the tools of science. Okay. Um, yeah. They're the right, beginning right. of a mm -hmm. symbolic expressions mm -hmm. of these mysterious things. Yeah. One thing to realize yeah. is one of the things we know least in the world mm -hmm. is our own minds. Oh, um, it's pretty the, complex. Yeah, yeah, the human mind is a very, very strange well, thing. Well, mind is one thing, brain is another. I think there's a hundred trillion cells in a human. Well, a hundred billion is the standard yeah. figure, and yeah. I believe Dorian Sagan in yeah. his new book uses yeah. a figure that's, uh, or it's a hundred, no, it's a hundred billion. Well, uh, uses a figure that seems to be beyond that, but I'm not quite sure. I've only skimmed the book. Well, there's a so hundred trillion cells in a human organism. There's a hundred trillion the brain in the body. is part of a human right, organism. Right, exactly. Yeah, right, right, um, right. But the point is, it's a pattern recognition machine, yeah. and the point is, the yeah. consciousness knows very little of what it does. For yeah. example, yeah. if you're walking down a street on mm -hmm. Fifth Avenue, for yeah. example, on a crowded day, I've done it, um, and mm. you're busy thinking about the origins of the universe and how to make things multimedia. I do too much of that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, your body is yeah. doing this. It yeah. is somehow managing to right. go through this very crowded obstacle yeah. course of other human That's beings, right. all of whom are moving. Yeah, right. And it like navigates, game. and it yeah. comes within an eighth of an inch yeah, of many right. of them, and never I've touches noticed. them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, those rare occasions your when you do fits bump. Behind somebody who's going yeah. Down. yeah, right. Now, yeah. that is a highly complex processing Absolutely. machinery. Um, That's a non-conscious mind yeah, function. Right. Uh -huh. And your mind is doing all that without uh -huh. your being aware of it at all, unless somebody comes along and points 
points it out to you, you yeah. might never notice it. You might right. go through your whole life yeah. without noticing it. Right, How right. the hell does well, it happen? Yeah. But the, the mind is like this. If you go to Carlsbad Caverns in yeah. New Mexico, if you yeah. were one of the people to discover Carlsbad Caverns, yeah. you would have found that during the day at noon, when mm. there was a lot of sunlight, mm. you could have seen 150 feet into the cavern because mm. the cavern is the, the opening of the cavern is the size of a cathedral. Yeah, yeah right. it's enormous. Yeah. And but beyond that 150 feet with you sunlight, you could dimmer, not see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, if you'd had candles, let's yeah. say it was 1850, and right. candles are a relatively new invention, and right. inexpensive candles yeah. at that point, yeah. um, and you'd used candles, you could have gotten in maybe a quarter of a mile yeah. altogether before you ran out of candles. How did the Cro-Magnon um, people get into those back caves That's in a good question, uh, and I've always wondered. But in yeah. the meantime, yeah. if it's, a, yeah. if it's uh, 100 years later and you have flashlights, you're able to carry a lot of spare batteries, yeah. you can get a mile, you can get two miles. Right. The point is yeah. that there are 10 miles roughly of cavern down yeah, there, right, but right. you only get to right, see the right. tiny part that's, a good that's in the light. That's a good metaphor. And that's yeah, how yeah. mind is. Yeah. And we still, even though we're 250,000 years into the experiment of having minds, uh -huh. we have still not gotten beyond that first 150 yards uh -huh. of the mind surface. Isn't it getting more and more all the time? We're coming to understand things more and more. We're coming to understand I things mean, more and more. I mean, just think, 25 years ago, we didn't even know about neurotransmitters existing and, in the brain. But there are many, Swear many things God. that in psychology and science we never talk about. For yeah. example, that torchlight parade that yeah. Adolf Hitler used to run in order to give his people a feeling yeah. of being ein Volk, ein, yeah. ein Reich, ein yeah, Führer. Extreme um, supernationalism. And Gott he, mit and he, uns but, but he also gave people, we all ache for a feeling of being a part of something bigger than ourselves. He well, yeah. gave his people a sense of being that something bigger than themselves. He little gave overdone, them, I think. But he the gave them an ecstatic thing. sense. Yeah. He, yeah. I, no, oh, I'm yeah. not justifying what he did. No, no, he was a monster. Yeah, right. But yeah. the fact is, he was using these forces of, of deep, primal crowd emotion right. to accomplish fairly astonishing things. Yeah. Things that would have been awful if he'd been yeah, able to yeah, accomplish yeah. them. He was extremely popular along about 1939. Yeah, and even know, in the, the United time. States. Yeah. And yeah. there are. Fascism, the the yeah. question of how he did this is yeah. not one we raise in science. It's one I've been raising ever since I was 10. Really? But yeah. that puts me outside the bounds of normal science. Yeah. But Chiu Kaku does not raise these yeah. kinds of questions. No, he's into physics, yeah, but he does have a, he has a, yeah, okay, yeah, go on, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, Sigmund Freud would have been receptive to these kinds of questions, but it wasn't really his main beat. Uh -huh. um, yeah. His main beat was the individual mm. psychology. Yeah. yeah, And so there are all, but that's just one of many, many, many yeah. mysteries that's whose right. questions we haven't even Particularly formed yet. Particularly when you're like in this film, you're taking into the whole universe, right. including all of physics, quantum mechanics, right. all the different things, art and right. science and all the rest of it right. and everything in, and t in, in one pattern recognizing right. thing. Right, and pattern recognition and is the key to all of these It would seem to be it's impossible. I, I'm going to spend a whole lifetime understanding the use of the semicolon in 13th century French poetry in the southeast part of right. France. You know, you're going to be specialized, and that's what they're doing by right. and large. Multimedia is only coming. Uh, I know uh, James Joyce or some other people had a thing, or Marshall McLuhan had some things about this saying. Uh, he, he said he would, oh, he was great. I don't know if you knew him at all. Oh. McLuhan, no. McLuhan. He was no, great. We used to visit with him every yeah, spring amazing. up in Toronto. He had a great, he was an amazing guy. Yeah. Amazingly interesting wiring. He said Hitler would have never survived the television age, yeah. for instance. It's interesting. Like, you can par compare it to evolution in right. a certain sense through time because it was a hot medium and it was extending one consciousness. He <coughs> or McCarthy fell apart after television came because it was the medium is the message. He said right. the medium is more important than the message that's right. being delivered right. and so forth. So it's part of an evolutionary pattern in terms of extended consciousness right. that the media is. Right. So now we're getting to where we got multi-sensorial capability right. of that, and that's your da you're working in that also, and I think we certainly are here at m and and that film that they did uh, is just including like a like uh, it's not a dot within a pointless painting. It's the whole painting. Well, you know that there is a, a theory in this book in the yeah. God Problem yeah, called right. the Big Bagel, and it's a theory mm. of the begin, middle, beginning, middle, and end of the universe. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and it's difficult to explain in words, although this book does it in words. It does it beautifully. Well, yeah. thanks. Yeah, but, yeah. But I really knew that the only way I'd ever be able to explain it was in 
graphics right. was through an animation. Yeah. And an animator called Brian, named Brian Brandenburg volunteered to animate it for me. The Big Bagel. Yeah, bagel. the Big Bagel. And yeah, when yeah. it went on, on YouTube, yeah. it's had well over three quarters of a million hits. Wow, it's a lot. So yeah. there are certain things with, with which you can only get across with that pictures. That illustrates certain parts of thermodynamics or something. Or well, you know thermodynamics, that one of the major points in this book is there are five heresies. Yeah, right. And one of the major heresies is that the theory of thermodynamics, the second law of thermodynamics, that all things tend toward entropy, that all things fall apart, that all things tend toward disorder, yeah. is, is dead cowboy. wrong. Yeah, yes, yeah, I know. Exactly. Well, well if, you're going to, if you're going to throw the gauntlet down, you might as well have it be a big gauntlet, yes, you know, exactly. because the whole scientific community just uh, worships at the altar Well, of but the what you've just law. seen second in these law. eight minutes from yeah. the History Channel yeah. Yeah. Um, There's is a lot the universe going on. that's building up. It doesn't look you like entropy to me. No, you yeah. start with something that yeah. yeah. looks, looks to a normal human eye, very entropic, yeah. this Big Bang, yeah, right. um, that seems fairly random yeah, right. um, in the way that it spreads. Right. And from that point on, everything becomes more complex, more intricate, everything dances up, nothing dances may, that's down. A, that's a big one, there's another one, that, that's a biggie. I don't know whether it makes a difference if it's a closed or open system. And one of the things about no, string... No, that's a dodge. Uh, no, you think, well, open maybe systems. it is, but I am of the opinion that things are sort of synergetic, always have been. There are behaviors of system evolutionarily different than what you would and get from... synergy is the, the, the magic of the word. Parts. Because what you see in here, they show you at the 380,000 year mark, they show you the birth of the first atoms. Yeah. That's a synergy right yeah. there. Yeah, they're it all takes, It takes an electron and a proton to make an atom. That's right. That's right. And the synergy, their behavior systems. Let's just say a system is an evolutionary system, a political system, a social system, whatever. It's the behavior of systems unpredicted by the sum of the parts. There's something more than the sum of the parts right. as it's ingested. That's right. That. So they show you an electron and a proton. And yeah. what is an electron and a proton? Oh. It's not just an electron plus a proton. Yeah, but it's a whole new thing called an atom. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, yeah. in terms of the second law and all that, is it, it is uh, you know it's it's the behavior of system. It's uh, in time. Things emerge in time. It, you you, but you that's know, the point. Things yeah. emerge in time. They yeah. don't diverge. emerging properties. We could call yes, it synergy, exactly. right? And that's, and that's the what opposite we call, no. of the second law. You think it's oh, the it's opposite? Absolutely. The okay, you think it the is. The second okay. law says all things tend toward disorder. Well, yeah, what but you've no, got, but it makes a saw. point. Yeah, but, yeah. Let me get to this. This yeah, is a really important thing because you got a whole world of science that believes, uh, 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 you know, well, that's why the God problem in Curtin's Curtain could be, be the second law. Right. Or any, op, any um, um, what's the term, any uh, overarching absolutist kind of take on anything is right. really suspect within a synergistic universe where everything is changing through time in a synergetic kind of way right and so that's a that's a that's a thing that's uh, that's a it's a problem whether it's an open or closed system and how the hell what and the question that could be argued and it's very easy to say well God did it that's an easy way that we've right. been able to do through time we needed to have some sort of an explanation of what's it all about with right. our self-reflective consciousness and everything, so God did it, and that makes it easy, and then God's met us on every nationalist belt right. anywhere in the world, and all that nonsense that we're still uh, plagued with and so forth. But we don't know with the string theory, at least from Michio talking, and, and Brian Greene and so forth, we don't know where the hell did that come from, and whether or not it may be part of parallel universes that are there, in which case, we don't know whether it's an open and closed system with any kind of certainty. Well, I would strongly recommend discarding the ideas of open and closed systems because they okay. are, they are, okay. uh, they are, you remember the days of the Ptolemaic system yeah. when they started adding epicycles within epicycles. Sure, with Jupiter and, particularly. And these are yeah. epicycles. The fact of the matter is that at every stage of what you just saw with, yeah. with this first eight minutes of yeah. the History Channel thing, uh -huh what you see is larger and larger synergies producing newer and newer emergent properties. Right, right. The electron and the proton produces yeah. the atom. The right. atom has an additional property, not just of being an atom, but of being hydrogen or also helium. Also, the pithocene uh, produces homo sapiens. Right, but Up then, then these things, but evolution. then the hydrogen and helium oh. atoms begin <laughs> to gather together and they make galaxies. Mm -hmm. And now, according to entropy, they should be falling apart. They mm. shouldn't be sweeping together. Mm. Um, and yet they are sweeping together. 
together in these giant curling streams of a galaxy. Well, and right. then yeah. the galaxies come chunking together into giant gravity balls. Yeah. And those are stars. And the gravity balls at a certain point ignite. Yeah. They start bursting right, right. the nuclei at yeah. their hearts, yeah. tearing them apart. Yeah. And that's an entirely new kind of synergy. Let it's me a ask sun. you something of that little eight minute piece. What yeah. I'm thinking of, uh, I had my DNA, did I tell you that? No. I, yeah, I had my DNA done and everything. Yeah. It's got, they, in DNA, you can trace your lineage. Right. And you can trace it with uh, with scientific accuracy called markers. Right. Okay? And it's got a scientific basis. And right. I don't think it's all bullpucky. Right. Think there's something to it. And they traced it back to an ancestor of mine on the Y chromosome with right. males, to an ancestor of mine, me as an individual, to an ancestor that existed 60,000 years yeah. ago. Yeah. That, that's Isn't pretty that amazing. Isn't that amazing? Yes. And the, the person, as uh, did we all, uh, was in Ethiopia. Was today Ethiopia? Yeah. And well, then they, they come closer. So right. what they call markers. Now that piece of, uh, we could see when you get a comprehensive thing going like that. Right. They put out eight minutes, we put out eight minutes. There could be 17,000 disciplines on the details of what was being contained right. in there. What you're looking for in terms of the presentation are markers of the correctness generally of the pattern recognizing right. that's going on by people who aren't the specialists who could right. go with great excruciating detail on each and everything. Right. right? So that's a pattern I think that's available to us now that hasn't been available to us in terms of the extended use of, I mean, it's only coming out of the, the, the modern time that, uh, that, that, that the understanding of things, like for instance, I, uh, I can remember Mendeleev. Right. Mendeleev came up with the elements. I remember it was, it was really clear to me as a person interested in everything, not in great detail, there were 92 elements. Right. That was it. Right. 90, now I see, I looked in the book the other day, right. I think, there's 122. Where the hell did the other two, where did the other elements come from? They've been working in labs to synthesize them. Oh, uh, is that, okay, um, oh, you know well, something yes, about that. But, but once wasn't they, it true there were 92 elements yes, and that was it? Yes, okay. and, and, uh, That's a synergy. And without, or without emerging the, property. But, but without the theory of the atom yeah. that underlies that atomic table, mm. um, we wouldn't know that you could add extra protons oh, and that? get bigger and bigger atoms. Oh, so that's so, what that is. Yes. That's what it accounts for. Right. Okay. It okay. wasn't until the end of the 19th and the early 20th century that uh -huh. we had the modern understa understanding of the atom. Uh -huh. um, the with periodic the proton, table. the electron, oh, and, okay, yeah. you know, underlying yeah. the periodic right, table. Right, 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 right. So, um, and, and in this book it says maybe we are atoms way of, of building new atoms. And what uh -huh. does that mean? Uh -huh. Once you get past roughly 100 12, the atoms are no longer stable. You oh. can build them and put them together, they fall apart again. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a theory that yeah. between something like 112 and 152, there's a period of instability. And then once uh -huh. you get past that, you get up to 152 protons in an atom, uh -huh. all of a sudden you reach another period of stability. Uh -huh. So atoms could... Well, that sounds a little bit like evolution. Yes, it is it evolution. It is evolution. Yes. New good book out by Dawkins. Yeah. Dawkins. Yes. Know, it's called and The Ancestors' Very smart, Tale. very yeah. entertaining. Yeah, I yeah. highly recommend him. Yeah. Read this first. It's yeah. tries to be even more entertaining I would, than Dawkins, I, but that's hard. I would... Uh, he is. He's a good writer, and he's also a good science enemy, but it's a way of... Tra uh, tracing back through the evolutionary, well, you were talking about that, that's an evolutionary process, and the evolution, he, they said that everything that is, it's all connected, that first big a bang and so forth, is connected to us. I mean, it's all one system. We're children of the Big Bang. We're the children stuff, of the universe. Yeah, the stuff yeah. that's in our bones is not yeah. just star stuff, it's yeah. stuff that goes all the way back to the first instant oh. of the Big Bang, and that first instant, Quarks were born. Quarks got together in groups of yeah, three. Yeah, but where did that Big Bang come from? Well, One of the things, if I may, yeah. as, as a layman, right. right? I'm not every, you know, I love Michio Kaku. I think Michio Kaku is a great national yeah. treasure. He tries to make physics understandable to the general citizen, right. which is a great task because they can get all wrapped up in uh, all, almost as bad as the derivatives traders in the market. You right. Know, with uh, all kinds of things that can't be understood by anybody. But he's really good. And he, he just, um, he just uh, presented all this stuff that uh, is so good, and I, I really appreciate him. And I'm sorry, I've forgotten now what it is that uh, he had said that it slips my mind. It'll come to me in a minute. But what you, you'll yeah. see in this entire picture is yeah. 
at no stage are things falling toward disorder. Even what looks like a tumble toward uh -huh. disorder yeah. turns out to be a tumble toward a higher order. Uh -huh. For example, the collapse of stars. Yeah. You'll notice that uh, Filipenko said mm. that uh, a few million years after the formation of the first stars, uh -huh. they began to die in supernovas. Well, and, and now that, 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 that would seem to be entropic, right? Yeah. Well, the that's stars the, dying. Well, that's drawing upon also back to evolution. You go back and forth. If physics and that and everything and a 99 you got 99.8 and you're kind of thinking i got 99.9 .9 of all species that have ever existed have gone extinct but let's go back to those dying stars mm. that may look entropic mm. it may look like things no. are tending toward disorder they are not in uh -huh. the hearts of those stars atomic nuclei are being smashed together in entirely new ways uh -huh. and in that smash mm -hmm. um is being produced uh, iron and uh, gold well, that's what they and said. right. Well, it, it and took supernova right. to get to those rare metals. Well, it's those things. supernovas yeah. that take us. And it happened. From, that take us from only three kinds of elements, yeah, right. hydrogen, hey, helium, helium, and yeah, selenium, right, right. to 92 elements. Yeah. 89 of them are the res are, come to us courtesy of the yeah. death of stars. Yeah, right. So even though Super stars Nova, seem yeah. to be falling apart, yeah. they are making things fall together uh, in new synergies. In a long synergy, of an, ex a, 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 an emerging property that is a synergy. Yes. But the synergy is that you've got no absolutes. No, and the point being at the, with, the, with the grind green in that is where... Did the, uh, where did the, uh, w how did that happen? Well, you do have a now, few. Now, if you, you have, yeah. if, you, if I may, and yeah. I don't know, this Go is ahead. thinking very. That's right. You were looking for how did it all begin? Where did it right, all come from? Right, and everything. And like, if you've got, if I understand it, he's presented this, he's done super string or thing th field theory. He calls right. it as Brian Green in the field. And that's only just come up in the last 10 years or something. We had, we had uh, Einstein, and then we had quantum mechanics, and we had Heisenberg, and we had all the things going on of understanding you know, physics in the normal way, and then along comes thing, string theory, and it's like a thing uh, that's coming, and it is that there may be parallel universes, and that we are connected by parallel, and that if you have the image as a citizen, you have the image of, let's say there's a sink full of Irish uh, of bubbles, mm -hmm. and that they're connected, they're bubbles, right. and they're connected by, the, the, we, we, we understand, they're connected by wormholes. Right. They're connected. So that the exist this universe could be connected to other universe. You could think of it as parent universe. Right. If you want to put the kick the football down right. the line. Well, you Lee know. Small and the astronomer yeah. uh, does yeah. regard it that way. But it way. could be so that what would be happening is that would be just a, and, and you have a bubble. You got a bubble, and then there comes two bubbles, and the bubbles are connected. Right. And so our universe might have come from another universe that is uh, that's connecting like two bubbles in a sink. Right. You understand? And, and Lee Smolin so that means it is it closed or open? Well, but and again, still that's think not it a relevant be a, question. You think it should be abandoned? I don't think yeah. Mr. Kaku thinks the second law or that should you be abandoned. You won't find a single scientist who thinks the second law should be abandoned. What oh, you'll that's find what is I'm me. saying. You, that's right. You're in I'm a class alone. by yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and yet, if you look at the universe at every stage, yeah. it avoids entropy. It does the opposite of uh, entropy. It builds. Yeah. This is a universe that goes up. It doesn't tumble down. Well, what about that? What is the... Okay, okay, that's interesting. Because, like, Fuller, we, I, mm -hmm. I think all the intellectual community of the world, I think, uh, without exception, uh, admires Fuller. I right. think, and everything, as a great system thinker. And he tried to cast about for uh, a, a human purpose, or you could say evolutionary right. purpose, apex by mankind. Right. And he, he wanted to posit. I don't think... Right. Ca ca uh, Dorian likes this idea or yeah. something with Schneiderman. Uh, right. with Schneider, Schneider, who, who wrote the Into the Cool yeah, and into everything. Yeah, Into the Cool, Dorian. Yeah, Sagan Into the Cool. It's Schneider. a great book, great yeah. book on that. But anyway, he said that the biological evolutionary pro or you could say the evolutionary process, there was a period when there was not biology uh, 3.8 billion years ago and so on. But you have a, uh, the whole movement synergistically across time. It was an anti-entropic function in the universe to bring increased conscious pattern of understanding to the process of which we are a part. Right. So that gives a sense of some purpose to this whole 
Mishigash. Right, and the question of uh, purpose, whether there is or is not purpose, whether it's legitimate to talk about purpose or mm, not, mm. that's called the discussion of teleology. Yeah, teleology right. is moving toward a future goal, a telos. Yeah, um, yeah. And that's a big one that philosophy. isn't being, yeah. it isn't very often discussed in Tell science at Chardin, all. Tell Chardin, do you think? Yeah, uh, or, or Chardin and... Uh, well, no, this uh, happened in, eight, in roughly 1860. There yeah. was a German, um, yeah. Ludwig, I'm forgetting his last name, who wrote a book that is now to almost totally forgotten, mm -hmm. in which he single-handedly banished teleological thinking. Well, that would be like kind of a massive thing to do. It's a little bit difficult to banish anything if you can keep it on the table of consideration. What you want to avoid is um, absolutism. Right. That absolute, this is absolute forever and ever and right. ever because you're likely to be surprised. And everything should be up on the table that can possibly be accommodated within right. a pattern recognizing and, but thing. But what you're looking Including for... Including the idea of God should be up on the table right. and there should be uh, Dawkins and others that have a materialistic understanding of things should be up on the table and give consideration. But if you have an absolutist thing, that just wipes out anything well, other than that. Certain, Abs like you're, Hitler. You're always stuck with certain absolutes. For example, yeah. uh, How we, many? we absolutely adhere to the idea that logic in some way is not only a tool that we humans use, but mm. that it's something built into the cosmos. Well, Galileo felt that way. Einstein felt that way. Um, uh, oh, God, my favorite. Uh, ah, I'm forgetting his name. But at any rate, um, all the great thinkers have seemed to feel that way. Yeah. Um, this design, book, some sort yeah, of design. But this yeah. book points out the God problem, yeah. points out, yeah. it shows you the evolution of our logic. Yeah. It shows you how Aristotle yeah. dictated many of the things that we think are logical, oh. and that some of those things simply don't hold up 2,300 mm. years later. Right. Um, mm. One of them is that A, a equals A. Uh, Aristotle's big thing was yeah. the law of identity. Uh, that if a uh, thing is itself, it is itself. That yeah. uh, if A, equal, a equals A equals A equals A. Uh -huh. And yet every instance of an A mm -hmm. is different. Every instance of an A that I say to you is a different puff of air right, with right. different molecules. That's true. Um, that every is true, every yeah. A that you read on a page, uh -huh. your mind is in a different mood. Right, your mind right. is changing moods from one word to uh -huh. the next right. as you're uh -huh. reading a page. Uh -huh. The context of A's, uh, if, if you type one A at 9 o'clock in the morning and another one at 9.01, mm -hmm. um, your, um, your, the room in which you type it, has moved around the center of the planet 115 miles. Right, right, it's right. moved, uh, the, the planet has moved 567 miles around the core of the galaxy. Uh -huh. um, the galaxy has moved 864 miles mm. um, around the core, well, outward. Mm -hmm. So one, so everything has changed. Mm -hmm. And of course, if in the most in the most important place of all, your mind, your mind mm -hmm. is on to other things. Mm -hmm. Your uh, mind between what? your mind from nine o'clock to nine oh one yeah. is in a different shade a slightly different shade of oh, mood, yeah. Uh, yeah, a yeah, bunch yeah. of different preoccupations. Yeah. Depending if um, I had coffee or not. Right. Yeah, right. So A yeah. does not equal A. Yeah, yeah. Um, now A equals A to a certain point. Uh -huh. um, and yes, uh, the <clears throat> the mathematics of A equals A is called algebra. Uh -huh. And algebra has proven to be remarkably effective mm -hmm. at getting man on the moon, at mm -hmm. getting satellites into yeah. space, at mm -hmm. helping Albert Einstein figure out the theory of relativity, yeah, right. and all kinds of stuff. And mm -hmm. it is based on A equal sign A. Mm -hmm. That's called an equation. Yeah. An equation because of the equal mm -hmm. sign in the yeah. middle. Right. And yet A never quite is, equals A. Yeah, yeah. And so Unce then that's just not uncertainty. I mean, like Heisenberg or something. No, like, there's, no uh, there's no word for it. There's no word for it. Because it hasn't been challenged, to the best of my knowledge, except until this by book. Bloom. Yeah. The Bloom. But, but the you Bloom know, factor. But when you grow up in science, you grow up <laughs> yeah. knowing that your job is to look for things that other people take for granted. Yeah, right. And to, and to pull up the rock yeah, and right. see what's underneath it's investigative it. thinking. Yeah, yeah, that's your yeah. job as a scientist. Uh -huh. Otherwise, you're not a valid part of the community. Absolutely. Of scientists. Yeah, that's You're not true doing enough. your and job. That's the scientific process. I was really right. sorry to see Dorian's mother, Lynn Miles. Oh, was God, sad. yes. I was saddened by I her. I was loss. too. And yeah. she was a tremendous supporter for me. Uh, she was she was a tough cookie. Yeah. Um, and when she described nature as one tough bitch, she was <laughs> she was explaining herself. Yeah, she yeah. was describing herself. Yeah. But she contributed enormously to yeah. the biology of the 20th century. Have you seen the book Dazzle Gradually? No, what it's is it? It's off 
left the poem. That's the book that she yeah. and Dorian wrote. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah, it's a, on biology. It's yeah. biology. Wow. That, well, it's off the uh, the uh, Emily Dixon poem about dazzle gradually or every man be blind. Right, and I think she one. lived in a house that Emily Dickinson had lived in yeah, they or were something up there like in that. that. Country. She yeah. was wonderful. And she also had truck with, interestingly, maybe relevant to what we're trying to talk about here, with James Lovelock. Right. Oh, and she I and think James the, Lovelock were yeah, the ones who came up with the gay hypothesis. They come, well, I'm not sure if she came up with it, did she? They were she, both credited okay, for it. Were they? Okay, that's yeah. interesting. Co Co-determinant. Oh, that, yeah. That's really interesting. And you know how Lovelock came up with the gay hypothesis? Well, who came up with it? Did they come Lovelock up with it together? Lovelock came up with it, but then they uh, they must have worked together on it in some form he, because she was it was associated a jointly credited with her, thing. And she could have been our greatest, recognized as the greatest American biologist, but there are some people who think her having truck with uh, anything like the Gaia, that's being the idea of seeing the earth and so forth like as an organism. Well, right? she looked mm. at, uh, she was willing to take up unconventional views. Uh, there mm. was another uh, scientist named Thomas Gold who believes that the oil, the reason we not, we're not running out of oil, mm. is that the idea that oil is made up of dinosaurs who were crushed under uh, who died and, and were wow. crushed down to the bottom of marshes and then made it down into deep rocks under the ground. Mm. He thinks that's nonsense. He thinks that oil, um, like carbon, car doesn't take uh, dying life forms to mm -hmm. make carbon, mm -hmm. uh, and he thinks that oil is one of those uh, carbonaceous products that is made spontaneously, abiotically, without uh -huh. the input from life. Uh -huh. It's made by rocks. It's made by planets. Biotic? Abiotically. 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 Sorry, yeah. Okay, right. yeah. Without uh -huh. life. I haven't heard um, that. I well, heard she that. was a big supporter of Gold's, uh -huh. and she took chances, uh -huh. you know, to to uh, endorse somebody who's that far off the beaten path. <coughs> right. Um, is to take a big chance on losing your own credibility. Yeah, Nonetheless, right. she was a national also, science... Also, uh, access to the peer-reviewed journals and all that yes, kind of exactly. general like, that tenure and all the other kinds right. of... You but know, she was a National of Medal academic. of Science winner. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, and she managed to hold on to her credibility. To, mm. and, and the Gaia hypothesis has been very well accepted. Uh, the Gaia hypothesis is now taken for granted for all uh, practical purposes. Really? You think yes, that? Yes, yeah? absolutely. Oh, um, because uh, it is not that the Earth is a purposeful mother mm. who lovingly uh, holds us to her bosom. It's mm. that the Earth as a totality is a mm. self-correcting system. Mm -hmm. And that the, the Earth, the living matter on this Earth has cooperated with the non-living matter on this earth to give us a certain kind of atmosphere we'd, we would never have had without the living matter on this earth. Mm -hmm. And that when major climate catastrophes happen, and they do happen regularly. So they've been taught that, all of the time, yeah. But the, that the um, biosphere mm -hmm. keeps them within certain limits. Yes, mm -hmm. they go to a killing extremes, mm -hmm. but they're not as extreme as they could be. And one example of that is mm -hmm. this Planets if do they not, were extreme as they could have been, this would have been a dead planet. This would have been a dead yeah, planet, right, right. exactly. And it, it, that it isn't is like, I can't, every day I wake up, I can't believe everything exists. Well, it's one, amazing. Now, if you if we stopped you from breathing for yeah. eight minutes, what would happen well, to you? Well, I would, uh, I would be gone. Yes, yes and yeah. that would be because of lack of what particular... Uh, well, I suppose, uh, among others, oxygen. Oxygen. Yeah, yeah. And if it weren't for the living matter on the face of this planet, there would be no oxygen That's in right. the air at That's all. That's right, yeah. Um, yeah. Because yeah. the oxygen was all bound in uh -huh. oxidized uh -huh. things. It was yeah. bound in stuff like rust. Yeah. And it took living beings mm. to break that bond apart. Mm -hmm. And those living beings uh, created oxygen as a waste product. Okay. And then they farted it out into That's the right. air. That's right. And yeah. all those little farts added up, and then we had the great oxygen catastrophe that Lynn and Dorian portray so well yeah right. and until we learned that not all poisons that the poisons could be turned into pleasures yeah we learned how to turn this incredibly lethal poison mm. of oxygen mm. that had polluted the entire atmosphere yeah. into a fuel emerging source. new property synergistically around yeah it. exactly yeah. well that's really interesting we're getting talking we're coming out uh, one of the things is we run out one of the tyrannies we run out of time we're coming to the end of the time for this hour yeah. we're going to do another uh, we're going to do another uh, hour of programming, so we'd ask you to stay tuned. We're going to come back. We're talking with our guest, Howard Bloom, a major intellectual force on the planet Earth, and a book whose, uh, again, we plug the God problem. We're going to come back and talk about some of these matters to uh, air on the, the, next, uh, the day after this program will air. And so please stay tuned, and we'll be coming right back to tomorrow. So thanks a lot. <laughs> Not we'll exactly right back. We'll be coming back tomorrow. Something like that. Yes, it's synergetic. Right. It is <laughs> thing like that.